Hello, everyone. Are we all here? Yes? Thank you. Welcome. Feel free to get some refreshments, some wine. Not too much wine, just enough. <laughs> Doug's like, as much as you want. That's true, it's there. Until we run out, it's all yours. Thank you all for being here. This is a really special and wonderful night for us, especially for those of us in the MFA program because we are welcoming Craig. Where are you, Craig? There you are, Craig Santos Perez, who's here as an alum from our program. And we're so proud and happy to welcome you back to USF. And also, this is a really wonderful event because it is the pre-launch of the Honors College event series. And we have a lot of people to thank to you know, make this possible and also you know, to honor the fact that this new program is starting, this new college is starting, that will benefit so many undergraduates and graduate students alike. So thank you to the, the new Honors College. Thank you especially to Associate Dean Eileen Fung, who was a principal person driving the start of the Honors College, and to Monica Doblado, who's done a tremendous amount of work. Thank you also to the College of Arts and Sciences for the support. Uh, the MFA in Writing Program, thank you to us. Uh, special, especially thank you to Micah Ballard for doing so much of the work here. Thank you, Micah. Micah and Monica are sitting in the back. They don't, they don't want you to look at them, but you can feel free to look at them. <laughs> Thank you to the Department of English, Environmental Studies, Critical Diversity Studies, and all of you here. I think I forgot to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Beth Nguyen. I'm the Academic Director of MFA for just a little while longer. And it's always so fun to go to these events and to see friends and faculty, students, alumni, all of us here tonight getting to enjoy beautiful work. So first, though, an introduction, uh, after you make sure your phones are silenced and everything. First, uh, an introduction by our esteemed, wonderful poetry professor, D.A. Powell. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I was uh, teaching uh, Craig's work this week, and um, in my notes to myself, I wrote, a poem is a narrowing to create a widening. Um, that is to say that you know we try and use as few words as possible to say as much as possible. Um, I'm going to use a few more than a few words. Um, I'm extremely honored today to get to introduce our guest. When I first started teaching at USF in 2004, I received an email from my colleague, Professor Steinberg, letting me know that there was a grad student in the MFA program who would make a perfect TA. He's a reader for Pleiades. Always remember the importance of those internships. They do benefit us in so many ways. He's a reader for Pleiades, she said, incredibly smart, and he writes funny and angry comments on submissions. And so I met my first TA, <laughs> Craig Santos Perez, who had to miss half the classes due to schedule conflicts, but who more than made up for that time with his contributions to course materials, his compassionate and helpful comments on student work, and the level of engagement he brought to the art itself. Meanwhile, he was studying with uh, one of the great masters of lyric poetry, our emeritus, Aaron Shuren, and composing what would become not only his thesis for his degree at USF, but also his first book, Hacha, which means one, Volume one of From Unincorporated Territory, the now four-volume field guide, song cycle, docu-poem that charts the Marianas and Chamorro history, culture, and language. Craig did not simply graduate from USF. He embarked 
producing a singularly original body, body of work that looks back on his childhood in Guam, looks present to his, to his role as father, husband, and teacher in Hawaii, and looks future towards the ecological and political uncertainties facing a region buffeted by successive waves of colonialism, invasive species, military occupation, and economic exploitation. That's a lot of freight to carry. But Craig's decolonization reaffirms the political potency of a language in danger of disappearance and situates it within its complex proximities with trade languages, rough trade. As he writes in his preface, the colonial school system on Guam, when I grew up there, did not teach written Chamorro in the schools, a consequence of Americanization and a sustained desire to eradicate the native language. In the ocean of English words, the Chamorro words that he uses in his poems remain insular, struggling to emerge within their own excerpted space. From unincorporated territory starts with a from. It is about dislocation and diaspora. It is about learning that even oceans can be crossed with borders and how to resist being made to feel alien or foreign in a country that uses your homeland as a launching pad for military policing to spread the idea of democracy. I'm making verbal quotes there. Yet will not give you representation in Congress. It is the resistance at borders. At the same time, it is an ecological wake-up call an urgent intervention on behalf of future generations of Pacific Islanders, his daughters among them. Craig has been a voice enabling other voices. His commentary and art have drawn attention to environmental and social causes important to Native communities throughout Oceania and the Pacific with appearances in the Atlantic, the New Republic, Slate, Vice, and CNBC. As an associate professor at University of Hawaii, Craig curates the Native Voices reading and lecture series, the Chamorro Studies speaker series, and the new Oceania literary series. His books have received the Penn Center USA Poetry Society of America Literary Prize and the American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation. In 2016, he was named a Lannan Literary Fellow, the first Lannan Literary Fellow who's a native Pacific Islander. In 2017, he received the Hawaii Literary Arts Council Elliot Cades Literary Award, which is the most prestigious literary prize in Hawaii. It's been 12 years since Craig graduated from USF, and during that time, he has excelled as a poet and as an important and necessary American voice. We are proud to welcome him back to help celebrate the Honors College and its commitment to global citizenship. Craig Santos Perez. I am deeply honored and deeply jet lagged to be here today. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight on a Wednesday to share your time and listen to some poetry. Um, thank you, Doug, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you for letting me be your TA. That was my first experience uh, teaching in the college classroom. And I was so inspired by your teaching. And it really taught me a lot. And I've taken many of those lessons and applied them to uh, where I teach now in, in Hawaii. So <laughs> it's true. They hire anyone these days. Um, thank you to uh, Micah and Monica for, for setting up 
uh, my trip here today. Thank you to the MFA program, uh, to Beth, to the English department, um, to the Critical Diversity Studies program, Environmental Studies program, College of Arts and Sciences, and of course, the, the Honors program. I've kind of tailored my reading today, mostly new work actually, uh, that will touch on many of those issues of global citizenship, diversity, the environment, and of course, uh, issues in the Pacific and of my homeland. I also want to thank my, my family for coming out tonight. Uh, my, my dad and brother and good friend and my sister. And I get to meet my sister's fiance for the first time tonight. That's pretty cool. Uh, I want to thank uh, my friend Jules for coming out, who I haven't seen in a while, and, and my colleague Tina. We're both on sabbatical, but we both teach in Hawaii. <laughs> I want to thank, thank the scholars who are here for the Asian American Studies Conference for, for coming out tonight as well. Good luck in the conference. I hope you enjoy the poems. Uh, I feel so thankful. I think I'm going to begin with a poem that is thankful. But before I do, I want to thank one, one last person and really to dedicate my reading to this person, and that is to uh, my, my teacher, Aaron Shuren, uh, who's here tonight. Um, who I took several classes from and who really inspired me when I was here uh, as an MFA student and who, who really taught me um, really the, the prosody of, of being a poet. So, so thank you, Aaron. This poem is called A Global Thanksgiving and it's based on a true a uh, story, the actual Thanksgiving meal I ate in 2016. Thank you, instant mashed potatoes. Your bland taste makes me feel like an average American. Thank you, incarcerated Americans, for filling the labor shortage and packing potatoes in Idaho. Thank you, canned cranberry sauce, for your gelatinous curves. Thank you, Ojibwe tribe in Wisconsin, your lake is now polluted with phosphate-laden discharge from nearby cranberry bogs. Thank you, crisp green beans. You are my excuse for eating apple pie a la mode later. Thank you, indigenous migrant workers, for picking the beans in Mexico's farm belt. May your children survive the season. Thank you, NAFTA, for making life dirt cheap. Thank you, butterball turkey, for the word Butterball, which I repeat all day. Say it with me, butterball. 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 Because it helps me swallow the bones of genocide. Thank you, dark meat, for being so juicy. No offense, dry and fragile white meat. You matter too. Hashtag all meat matters. Thank you, 90 million factory farm turkeys, for giving your lives during the holidays. Thank you, factory farm workers, for clipping turkey toes and beaks so they don't scratch and peck each other in overcrowded dark sheds. Thank you, genetic engineering and antibiotics, for accelerating their growth. Thank you, stunning tank, for immobilizing most of the turkeys hanging upside down by crippled legs. Thank you, stainless steel knives, for your sharpened edge and thirst for throat. Thank you, de-feathering tank, for your scalding hot water, for finally killing the last still conscious turkeys. Thank you, turkey tails, for feeding Pacific Islanders all year round. Thank you, empire of slaughter, for never wasting your fatty leftovers. Thank you, tryptophan, for the promise of an afternoon nap. Globalization stresses me out. Thank you, store-bought stuffing, for your ambiguously ethnic flavor, you remind me that I'm not an average American. Thank you, gravy, for being hot off the boat and the most beautiful brown. Thank you, dear audience members, for joining me at the table of this poem. Please join hands. Bow your heads and repeat after me. Let us bless the hands that harvest and butcher our food. Bless the hands that drive delivery trucks and stock grocery shelves. Bless the hands that cooked and paid for this meal. 
Bless the hands that bind our hands and force feed our endless mouth. May we forgive each other and be forgiven. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was awesome. Now you have to clap after every poem, or else my poems will get jealous of each other. I'm not kidding. OK. This next poem is called Off Island Chamorros. And this is more of a kind of story of, of my, my migration uh, here to California. Off Island Chamorros. My family migrated to California when I was 15 years old. During the first day at my new high school, the homeroom teacher asked me where I was from. The Mariana Islands, I answered. She replied, I've never heard of that place. Prove it exists. And when I stepped in front of the world map on the wall, it transformed into a mirror. The Pacific Ocean, like my body, was split in two and flayed to the margins. I found Australia, then the Philippines, then Japan. I pointed to an empty space between them and said, I'm from this invisible archipelago. Everyone laughed. And even though I descend from oceanic navigators, I felt so lost shipwrecked on the coast of a strange continent. Are you a citizen, he probed. Yes, my island Guam is a US territory. We attend American schools, eat American food, listen to American music, watch American movies, play American sports, learn American history, dream American dreams, and die in American wars. You speak English well, he proclaimed, with almost no accent. And isn't that what it means to be a diasporic Chamorro, to feel foreign in a domestic sense? Over the last 50 years, Chamorros have migrated to escape the violent memories of war, to seek jobs, schools, hospitals, adventures, and love. But most of all, we've migrated for military service, deployed and stationed to bases around the world. According to the 2010 census, 44,000 Chamorros live here in California. 15,000 in Washington, 10,000 in Texas, 7,000 in Hawaii, and 70,000 more in every other state and even Puerto Rico. I think actually we fit in most in Puerto Rico. <laughs> we are the most geographically dispersed Pacific Islander population within the US and off-island Chamorros now outnumber our on-island kin with generations having been born away from our ancestral homelands, including my daughters. Some of us will be able to return home for the holidays, weddings, and funerals. Others won't be able to afford the expensive plane ticket to the Western Pacific. Years and even decades might pass between trips, and each visit will feel too short. We'll lose contact with family and friends, and the island will continue to change until it becomes unfamiliar to us. And isn't that, too, what it means to be a diasporic Chamorro? to feel foreign in your own homeland. And there'll be times when we'll feel adrift without itinerary or destination. We'll wonder, what if we stayed? What if we return? When the undertow of these questions begins pulling you out to sea, remember, migration flows through our blood like the aerial roots of the banyan tree. Remember. Our ancestors taught us how to carry our culture in the canoes of our bodies. Remember, our people scattered like stars form new constellations when we gather. Remember, home is not simply a house, village, or island. Home is an archipelago of belonging. Thank you. So I wrote that poem really for a lot of uh, Chamorro students I meet when I, when I travel around reading for my books. And earlier today, I got to meet with the Pacific Island Student Club. There are several Chamorros here at, at USF, uh, some of which are, are from Guam. They moved here for college, some of, which, uh, some of whom are, are, were born and raised here in California or Washington, but came here for school and, and haven't really been uh, to the Marianas. 
And so kind of that poem, I wanted to, you know, let those kids know that, uh, you know, home is, is, more than, is more than a place. And, you know, we kind of carry it with us wherever we go. This next poem is dedicated to my dad. Uh, it's called Ode and Elegy to Drinking a Can of Coconut Water with My Dad in California. <laughs> Once I bought a can of coconut water for my dad because he felt homesick for the island of our birth. After the first taste, he can't stop talking story about the tropical past. He claims as a barefoot child, he climbed the tallest coconut trees that touched the western Pacific sky. And he swears his grandpa removed the husk with his teeth and cracked the shell with his bare knuckles. And he swears his grandma grated the meat with her fingernails and squeezed it into milk and oil. These products are trendy and expensive now, I tell him. Imported from plantations in Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Thailand. He laughs and says his great auntie sat in a circle weaving coconut leaves, and if you pressed your ear to their woven mats, you could still hear their gossip and singing even after they died. And because circles make memories seem less broken, he recalls how his great uncles too sat in a circle, braiding dried coconut fibers into rope used to lash canoes and thatched houses, just as our veins bind our genealogies to endure the lashing of time and conquest. I read aloud the nutrition facts label. 45 calories, 30 milligrams sodium, 470 milligrams potassium, and 11 grams sugar. Fat and cholesterol free. He responds with this origin tale. Once a young girl beloved by our entire island dies during a time of drought. The family buries her and weeps upon the grave from which an unfamiliar tree sprouts. They watch it grow and bloom until its hard, strange fruit falls and opens on impact. The girl's mother braves the first sip, then smiles for the first time in years, as if her body, after having been completely emptied, is finally replenished. From that harvest, we planted a sapling whenever a child was born. As generations passed, the trees became kin, teaching us how to bend without breaking, how to create without wasting, and how to take without depleting. My dad tells me during his last visit home that invasive beetles are devouring our coconut trees. We discard the aluminum cans in the recycling bin and swallow the bitter aftertaste. Thank you. So one of the courses I teach at University of Hawaii is food poetry, <laughs> if you haven't noticed yet. Um, and so I think I'm going to read one more poem about food. Uh, this is more of a, you know, also a traditional food uh, back home. And it is called Spam's Carbon Footprint. Raise your hand if you've eaten Spam before. Nice. I feel like I'm back in Hawaii. <laughs> OK, this poem needs a little bit of your help. And so I need you to say, sp, sp, spam, sp, sp, spam, sp, sp, spam. That's the beat. Do it throughout the poem, sp, sp, spam. Guam is considered the spam capital of the world. On average, each Chamorro consumes 16 cans of spam each year, which is more per capita than any other country. Headline, Guam struggles to find its roots from beneath growing piles of spam. Guam, Hawaii, and Saipan have the only McDonald's restaurants that feature spam on the menu. Spam has a place not only in the stomachs of my people, but in our hearts as well. Here, spam is considered a gourmet luxury and is often presented as a gift at birthdays, weddings, and funerals. Not coincidentally, Spam is also popular in Hawaii, the Philippines, Okinawa, South Korea, and Saipan, all places with the history of US military presence. In fact, Spam may have been responsible for Hitler's defeat. The Allies would have starved without Spam. 
Plus, it's processed, so I guess we can keep it for the coming war between the U.S. and China and or North Korea and or ISIS and or Iran and or students and or black people and or Muslims and or Latinos. Wow, I haven't seen this much spam since I lived on Guam and the car dealership there started offering a 50-pound bag of rice and a case of spam with every car you purchased. You can rub the entire block of Spam along with the accompanying delicious gelatinous goo onto your wood furniture. The oils from the Spam moisturize the, the wood and give it a nice luster. Plus, you have enough left over to use as your own personal sexual lubricant. But as I got older and tried to be healthier, spam faded from my consciousness. Then I met my future wife who's Hawaiian and spam became part of my life again, a true Pacific romance. Maybe the economic downturn will help people truly appreciate spam instead of loathing it. Spam doesn't have to be unhealthy. I eat spam every day and I'm not dead. <laughs> the name itself stands for specially processed army meat salted pork, and more. Super pink artificial meal. Squirrel, possum, and mongoose. That's the Hawaii kind. Or some pigs are missing. My uncle is the reigning Guam Spam king. He won the last Spam cook-off with his spicy Spam rice balls. I'll never forget the two-pound Spam bust of George Washington he made for Liberation Day. Toasted crispy on the outside with raw egg yolk in the hollowed center. The kids loved it. For Christmas, I bought a Spam snow globe featuring a can of Spam sitting on an island. Turn it over and a typhoon swirls madly, unable to unseat Spam from its place of honor. I have a souvenir can I bought after seeing Monty Python spam a lot on Broadway in New York City. It cost me $10 and it's the most expensive spam I've ever bought. I will never eat it. Thank you. Good job. Give yourself an applause. Okay, this next one I'm going to read is also quite scary. Uh, it's called A Global Halloween. And this, this poem is based on a true story, the actual Halloween I had in 2016. Um, now, this requires your participation as well. When I point to you, I need you to say trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something good to eat in your creepiest voice. Okay? Global Halloween. Darkness spills across the sky like an oil plume. The moon reflects bleached coral. Tonight, let us praise the sacrificed. Praise the souls of black boys enslaved by supply chains who carry bags of cacao under West African heat. Sings a girl dressed as a Disney princess. Let us praise the souls of brown girls who sew our clothes as fire on thread sweatshops into smoke and ash. Whisper kids disguised as ninjas. Tonight, let us praise the souls of Asian children who manufacture toys and tech until gravity sharpens their bodies enough to cut through suicide nets. Shout boys camouflage as soldiers. Let us praise the souls of veterans who salute with their guns because only triggers will pull God into their ruined temples. Chant kids masquerading as cowboys and Indians. Tonight, let us praise the souls of native youth whose eyes are open pit uranium mines, veins, poisoned rivers, hearts, tar sands, tailings, ponds. Yeah. 
says a boy dressed as the sun. Tonight, let us praise El Nino, praise his growing pains, praise his mother, the ocean, who is dying in a warming bath of dead fish. Tonight, let us raise our hands up and praise our mothers of asthma, mothers of cancer clusters, mothers of miscarriage. Pray for us because our costumes won't hide the true cost of our greed. Praise our mothers of lost habitats, mothers of fallout, mothers of extinction. Pray for us because even tomorrow will be haunted. Thank you. So this next, this next poem also has a global theme. Um, one thing great about living in Hawaii, there are a lot of poets who are passionate about political issues as well. And so we often uh, organize events where we read poems as a way to raise money for certain causes. And um, during the height of, of the Syrian refugee crisis, or at least the height when it was in the news, uh, we did an, an event to raise money for that cause. And so this was you know, the poem I wrote. It's kind of a solidarity poem to raise awareness about that crisis uh, to folks in Hawaii and in the Pacific. Uh, the poem is called Care. My 16-month-old daughter wakes from her nap and cries. I pick her up press her against my chest, and rub her back until my palm warms like an old family quilt. Daddy's here, daddy's here, I whisper. Here is the island of Oahu, 8,500 miles from Syria. But what if Pacific trade winds suddenly became helicopters? Flames, nails, and shrapnel indiscriminately barreling towards us. What if shadows cast against our windows aren't plumeria tree branches, but soldiers and terrorists marching in heat? Would we reach the desperate boats of the Mediterranean in time? If we did, could I straighten my legs into a mast balanced against the pull and drift of the current? Daddy's here, daddy's here, I whisper. But am I strong enough to carry her across the razor wires of sovereign borders and ethnic hatred? Am I strong enough to plead, please help us? Please just let us pass. Please, we aren't suicide bombs. Am I strong enough to keep walking, even after my feet crack like halabi pepper fields after five years of drought, after this drought of humanity? Trains and buses rock back and forth back and forth, back and forth to detention centers. Yet what if we didn't make landfall? What if here capsized? Could you inflate your body into a buoy to hold your child above rising waters? Daddy's here, daddy's here, I whisper. Drowning is the last lullaby of the sea. I lay my daughter onto bed her breath finally as calm as low tide. To all the parents who brave the crossing, you and your children matter. I hope your love will teach the nations that emit the most carbon and violence that they should instead remit the most compassion. I hope soon the only difference between a legal refugee and an illegal migrant will be how willing we are to open our homes, offer refuge, and carry each other towards the horizon of care. Thank you. So I, I've, when my daughter was born, um, I started writing a lot of poems about her because you know, she was such a big part of my life. And you know, at the same time, I was still writing poems about various political, global, and, and environmental issues. So a lot of my poems started becoming you know, these juxtapositions between these kind of domestic, intimate family spaces, as well as these larger global spaces. And so this next poem I'm going to read uh, also features my daughter. 
uh, and it's called Rings of Fire. And I wrote it in 2016 uh, in Honolulu, where I live. Rings of Fire. We host a small family party to celebrate my daughter's second birthday. This year is the hottest in history, breaking the record set when she was born. Still, I grill meat over charcoal and watch smoke crawl through air like the spirits of sacrificial animals. Still, I crave a cigarette, even after quitting five years ago, even after my clothes no longer smell like my grandpa's tobacco breath, his oxygen tank still scratching the tiled floor of memory and denial. My dad joins me outside and says, son, when I die, scatter my ashes to the ocean far from this heat. Inside, my mom is cooking rice and steaming vegetables. They've traveled from California, where millions of trees have become tinder after years of drought, fueling catastrophe. When my daughter's body first hosted fever, the doctor said it's a sign she's fighting infection. Volcanoes erupt along fault lines and disrupt flight patterns, while massive flames force thousands to evacuate tar sands oil country. When we can't control fire, we name it wild and pray to gods for rain. When we can't control gods, we name it war and pray to votives for peace. If her fever doesn't break, the doctor said, take her to emergency. Violence rises with the temperature, which knows no borders. Airstrikes detonate hospitals in countries whose names are burnt fossils, Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Iraq. When she crowned, my wife said, it felt like rings of fire. Garment factories in Bangladesh char and collapse. Refugees self-immolate at a detention center on Nauru. Forests across Indonesia are raised for palm oil plantations. Their plumes, like the ashen ghosts of birds, flock to our distant rib cages. When my daughter can't breathe, we give her an asthma inhaler. But tonight, we sing happy birthday and blow out the candles together. The smoke trembles as if we all exhaled the same flammable wish. Thank you. So sorry, but, but uh, my daughter was, my whole family was supposed to come on this trip, uh, but my daughter had an asthma attack and she was hospitalized in, in the ICU this weekend. So. She's feeling better though, um, but I, that's why I had to kind of take a red eye and just come today and I leave tomorrow to be back with them. Okay, just two more poems. Uh, the, first one, the first one is short. It's one last one uh, with my daughter. Uh, it's called Blood Ivory. And it was, it was written um, as kind of a testimony to a political issue that was happening in Hawaii. There was a bill to ban the, the sale of ivory and the trade of ivory in Hawaii. And Hawaii actually has the third largest like, ivory sales in the US uh, after New York and California. So it was, it was quite a significant bill, even though Hawaii is a small place. And so I kind of wrote this and submitted it as my testimony in support of this bill, which, which actually passed. So lots of good efforts going towards protecting uh, the elephants. Blood Ivory. When we approach the elephant enclosure at the Honolulu Zoo, I lift my daughter up so she can see them playing in the shallow pond. Look, I say to her. They love the water like you. Today, 96 elephants are being slaughtered across Africa's wounded savanna. Poachers armed with assault rifles surround the herds. The adults stomp and trumpet, encircling their calves. Bullets, those small human tusks, bite through thick wrinkled skin. The men stand above the dead, but don't feel awe or majesty, 
They only feel their own awful poverty. So they hack, saw, and sever the incisors once used to split bark, dig, and forage. Flies swarm, vultures hover, and warlords sell the white gold to fund conflict and terror. The raw tusks are then carved into religious objects, art and jewelry, and smuggled across the planet, which has become our own man-made elephant graveyard. Why do we worship the things that cause others the most pain, like ivory and God? This year, 35,000 elephants will be slain. My daughter waves goodbye to the animals as we walk towards the exit. Do we build zoos to save what we've sacrificed? To display what we dominate? Or to cage our own wild urge to kill every breathing thing? My daughter plays with a stuffed elephant doll in the gift shop. Without a state ban, the, the ivory market in Hawaii will soon become the largest in the US. Look, I say to her, it has, it has ears and a mouth and eyes just like you. She touches its tusks, smiles, then touches her own teeth. Thank you. Okay, this is my last poem. Thank you all for listening and for participating. Um, this is the last time I'll ask you to participate. <laughs> and is there a Q&A after? Okay. So I'll just tell you, I brought chocolate-covered macadamia nuts straight from Hawaii. <laughs> I believe there are 12 of them, so the 12 first questions will get one chocolate-covered macadamia. So prepare your questions. <laughs> All right, this last poem uh, is also a solidarity poem, a bunch of poets. Uh, we did an event to support the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe during their fight to protect uh, their waters. And I wrote this poem called Chanting the Waters for that event. And so that was kind of the, the trigger for it and most of what it references. But it also uh, talks about water issues in Hawaii, uh, in Guam, in the Pacific, and it ends up becoming global as well. So what I need you to do is when I drum the podium twice, you have to say, water is life, as loud as you can. Because our bodies are 60% water. Because my wife labored for 24 hours through contracting waves. Because our sweat is mostly water and salt. Because she breathed and every breath is birthed from the ocean. Because our lungs are 80% water. Because water broke forth from her body. Because amniotic fluid is 90% water. Because our daughter crowned like a new island. Because our planet is 70% water. Because some say water came from asteroids and comets. Because some say the ocean formed within the earth from the beginning. Because water broke forth from shifting tectonic plates. Because the ocean is 99% of the biosphere. Because we say our gods created water. Because no human has found a way to safely create water. Because we can't drink oil. Because water is the next oil. Because 180,000 miles of US oil pipelines leak every day. Because we wage war over gods and water and oil. Because only 3% of global water is fresh water. Because the water footprint of an average American is 2,000 gallons a day. Because it takes 600 gallons of water to make one hamburger. Because more than a billion people lack access to clean drinking water. Because in some countries, women and children walk four miles every day to gather clean water and carry it home. Because we can't desalinate the entire ocean. Because if you lose 5% of your body's water, you will become feverish. Because if you lose 10% of your body's water, you will become immobile. Because we can survive a month without food, but less than a week without water. Because we proclaim water a human right. 
because we grant bodies of water rights to personhood, because we sign the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, because my wife says the Hawaiian word for wealth, vai vai, comes from their word for water, vai. Because corporations steal, privatize, dam, and bottle our waters. Because sugar, pineapple, corn, soy, and GMO plantations divert our waters. Because concentrated animal feeding operations consume our waters. Because pesticides, chemicals, oil, weapons, and waste poison our waters. Because we say stop, you are hurting our ancestors. Because they say we thought this was a wasteland. Because we say stop, keep the keep the oil in the ground, because they say we thought these bones were fuel, because we say stop, water is sacred, because they say we thought water is a commodity, because we say we are not leaving, because they say we thought you were vanishing, because we are water warriors and peaceful protectors, because they call us savage and primitive and riot, because we bring our feathers and lay and sage and shells and canoes and hashtags and totems, because they bring their bulldozers and drills and permits and surveillance drones and helicopters, because we bring our treaties and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, because they bring their banks and politicians and police and militia and National Guard and lawyers because we bring our songs and schools and prayers and chants and lawyers and ceremonies because they bring their barking dogs and paychecks and pepper spray and rubber bullets because we bring all our relations and all our generations and all our live streams because our drumming sounds like rain after drought echoing against our taut skin because our blood is 90% water, because every minute a child dies from waterborne diseases, because every day thousands of children die from waterborne diseases, because every year millions of children die from waterborne diseases. Because my daughter loves playing in the ocean, because someday she'll ask us, where does the ocean end? Because we will point to the dilating horizon because our eyes are 95% water, because we'll tell her that the ocean has no end. We'll tell her that the sky and clouds carry the ocean. We'll tell her that the mountains embrace the ocean into a blessing of rain. We'll tell her that the ocean sky rain fills aquifers and lakes. We'll tell her that the ocean sky rain lake flows into the Missouri River. We'll tell her that the ocean sky, rain, lake, river returns to the ocean and connects us to our cousins at Standing Rock. Because we'll tell her about the sacred stone of a mother holding her child. Because we'll tell her that the Sioux are still there and still breathing. Because our hearts are 75% water. Because while my daughter is sleeping, I will chant to her my people's word for water, Hanum. Hunnam, Hunnam, so her dreams of water will carry us home. Water is life. Water is life. Water is life. Awesome. Thank you all.